We are moving on to citizens participation. Lexington County School District 1's Board of Trustees solicits the advice and counsel of its citizens. To encourage this participation, the board provides a citizen's participation period during board meetings. In order to speak, you must be a parent or legal guardian of a student currently attending a Lexington District 1 school, a taxpayer residing in the Lexington District 1 attendance area, an employee of the district, or a student currently attending a Lexington 1 school. You may comment on agenda items, school operations, policies, programs, or other matters. You may not speak about specific individuals, whether students or staff, and I would like to add to that, or other parents, um, and I would encourage you to not be critical of folks that may have answered the survey differently than you. I mean, everybody has an opinion, and just because someone has a different opinion than you that doesn't necessarily mean that they um, should be criticized. Um, we want to remind you that this meeting is being live streamed, that the recording of this meeting will be part of the public record in perpetuity. We want to give everyone who came tonight an opportunity to speak. And in order to do that, I will call on each speaker by name and ask you to approach the lectern at the back of the room. The board will not reply to your remarks nor take any action during the board meeting in response to your comments or questions. You may address the board for up to three minutes. Um, I will encourage you, um, if someone has um, basically made your point, it would be great um, if you could just you know, state your agreement with that um, and preserve the time because we have a lengthy meeting tonight. Um, we want everyone to have a chance to speak, um, but we encourage you to um, keep your comments brief so that everyone does have a chance to speak um, before it gets too late. Um, please do not clap or make any comments, either while an individual speaks or after he or she finishes. Um, as you came in tonight, you received a card to fill out to indicate you wanted to speak. That card asks for your name, address, and other information. However, I will read just your name, the town you reside in, and the name of the schools your children attend when it is your turn to speak. Um, and I will remind you also that we are not voting on a mask mandate tonight. Um, and so if you want to just voice your um, agreement with that plan of action, that would be great. Um, you just we're not going to vote on a mask mandate tonight. So, um, and I would also encourage you to um, please be um, calm and courteous and um, model good behavior and good um, kindness and politeness. Um, you know, we have children in the room and we have students that watch. And I just encourage you to, um, to, to you know, model the behavior that you would expect in your own children. That would be wonderful this evening. If you are unable to attend the, um, this evening, um, or you're uncomfortable addressing the board in person, you can reach out to us by email, telephone, mail. Um, our contact information is available on the Lexington One website, and we do welcome all messages. So let's get started. First, we have Erin Smith. Ms. Smith um, lives in Lexington and has students that attend uh, Pleasant Hill Elementary and Pleasant Hill Middle School. Um, well, let me first say, Dr. Little, Madam Chair, rest of the board members, I know what you do is a completely thankless job, especially right now. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, when there's not a pandemic, it's, t it's hard being on a board of any kind, much less something that impacts people's children in such an intimate way. So I appreciate what you do. And I think it's unfortunate that um, you individually and collectively have received such negative feedback um, that's unfortunate. Um, Dr. Guyton, I think you hit it right on the head when you said that as an elected body, you've been completely undercut by our state government. Uh, we as a community have now lost the ability to provide adequate care and support for the education of the 28,000 children in Lexington County. That's unfortunate. Um, Nurse Wood, I really thought that your illustration of the toolbox of mitigating tools that we have that unfortunately are not being used in the schools themselves. And sadly, the community as a whole is not using these tools. Um, so let me just, let me start with that to say thank you. Um, my children, and nobody expected whenever uh, March of 2020, when uh, Henry McMaster closed schools down, when there were 200 diagnosed cases in South Carolina that we would be 18 months later having 50,000 people of Lexington County have been diagnosed. 622 people of Lexington County 
have died of COVID-19. That's not just a number. Those are families. Those are people. So those one people impact all of those around them. I feel that we as a community have a responsibility and a fiduciary duty to protect the health, wellness, mental health, and education of the children that we serve. That is why we as a community have elected you to, a, um, to this position. Now, I didn't know that we're not going to vote on mask mandate. No matter what my personal opinion is, like Dr. Guyton says, that ability has been taken away from you as our community leaders. Um, Dr. Phillips showed that there are negative impacts with test scores that are going to trickle down the longer our kids' educations are disrupted and having to go back from virtual to online. My children did Lula. It was a great experience because it was uninterrupted. They had the same educational model. So I just want to remind the community of the Lexington County mission statement. It is to cultivate a caring community where all learners are extraordinary communicators, collaborators, creators, and critical thinkers. That's where our focus needs to be. We need to teach our kids to take that science that they're never going to use, to take that home and in the community and execute it. Be that critical thinker. Use those skills, those tools that are available to them. And not politicize public health over our community's well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Next, we have uh, Ms. Jennifer Watkins Jeffcoat. Um, Ms. Jeffcoat lives in Lexington and has students at Deerfield Elementary and Carolina Springs Middle. Good evening. We were here last year advocating for our children, and now here we are back again. Have we not learned anything? As a community, we have not made any strides in realizing and meeting the needs of our children. We are right back to the no science mass mandates and the idea that virtual learning is just as effective as in-person learning. Well, let me tell you, a study out of Brown University has determined that children are experiencing a decline in their IQ and have a 22% lower IQ due to lack of stimulation and environmental influences, 22%. <clears throat> this study stated that children are inherently shaped by their environment and that masks worn in public settings and in school or daycare settings impact a range of developmental and learning skills. Even the mainstream news reported a couple weeks ago the significant decrease in our state education report card where Molly Spearman said she wasn't surprised. Well, I'm not surprised either. Education has taken a backseat to all other agendas. Excuse me. Are you happy? with our children being 22% less intelligent, as South Carolina already ranks 48th in the quality of education, we are currently one of the least educated states in the country. And let's continue to trend backwards. I always thought that Lexington School District 1 was the district to be in. So why wouldn't we want to be the gold standard? Instead, we get the videos gloating about the numbers where contact tracing has merely become a witch hunt to increase the numbers. The contact tracing has our teachers spending more time and energy on following the children's mannerisms and socializations than actually teaching them. How can the teachers possibly teach our children when they have to follow this? My healthy child was sent home to quarantine due to an alleged close contact and then could not return to school because the school closed. In contrast, my youngest child has been in school this entire time with no mask and has benefited from receiving an ed actual education. His school, Deerfield, has one of the lowest transmissions of any other school. The CDC even conducted a study in May 2021 regarding masks and found in 90,000 elementary students, there was no statistical significance different, significant difference uh, in rates of COVID transmission in schools that required masks and those that were optional. We have now entered cold and flu season, which happens every single year. Children have always historically gotten colds in the flu until last year. Why are we so afraid of our, to allow our children's own God-given immune system to handle the germs? You must get rid of this notion that masks do anything and know that our bodies were created to protect and heal. 
Children are resilient and recover quickly. However, the toll that the isolation and lack of social interaction had on our children last year was devastating. Childhood suicides, abuse, gang-related violence, and sex trafficking had seen an all-time high. We don't want to repeat this. The numbers are going down, so why are we trying so hard to change things now unless the concern is not about our children or masks, but merely about control? Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Jacob. Next, we have Brent Shannon Jeffco. Uh, he lives in Lexington, and his students attend Deerfield and Carolina Springs Middle. Okay, guys, you threw us a bit of a curveball with everything that you said. Um, we came here to fight against the mask mandate. It sounds like that's not going to happen, but I will say that the mitigations that we're looking at, I mean, we're admitting it. It's, it's Swiss cheese. They don't, they, don't, they don't work. It's an illusion of control, guys. It really is. Okay, we're following the community spread numbers, and that's for a reason. It's because that's how an endemic virus works, right? I mean, that's how it works, okay? I gotta go through some, some numbers here real quick. I went through some statistics last time. I think I lost a lot of people, but um, our kids are not really impacted by the virus itself. There's still no deaths in Lexington County for any child under the age of 20. Throughout the duration of this pandemic, Real quick, I'm gonna round the numbers. A one, this is US national averages, okay? One in 300,000 chance that a kid gets COVID and dies from it. One in 150,000 chance that a kid gets the flu and dies from it. That's twice, right? One in 90,000 drowning. One in 55,000 car accidents. Where's the mitigations for all those other things? We've lost focus. We've, we've shifted all our effort into COVID and it's not impacting our children. It impacts the elderly, sure, but there are mitigations that we know work, preventative treatment, prophylactics, right? <sighs> Protected, we, we, should, we should protect the elderly, not ruin our child's education, right? Um, I don't really, I don't know. I feel like I get up here. I'm not sure if anybody listened to me last time. Um, I, I, it feels like a, a, a wasted breath, right? We're all going through the motions. We can't escape this, this, this COVID train that's out of control. Um, I don't know. I mean, we feel like we need to do something. And we push our chips all in on on red, it's basically a game of roulette. So why can't I do it too? I'm gonna to push all my chips in on black. We're gonna send our kids back to school unmasked. And I think it's gonna follow the exact same trend that it did in the winter. If it doesn't, I'll come back and eat my mask. How about that? For anybody that didn't hear me. Bah, ah, bah, ah, bah, ah, bah, ah. Thank you, Mr. Jeffcoat. Next, we have Stephanie Berklist. Um, Ms. Berklist lives in Lexington, and I believe her children are homeschooled. Today. Okay, so um, I'm going to do something a little bit different than I typically do. I'm going to try to make it short, so you're all very welcome for that. But again, y'all threw me for a curveball. Kyle, I did actually listen to you about feeling helpless with your story in the village. Imagine how all of us parents feel. Helpless. We cannot even make decisions for our own children. They are mine. They are my family's. They are not yours. Miss Green, believe it or not, I actually listened to you, and you said our job is to help create productive citizens and to create people who behave a certain way politely in society. Guess what? That's my job. It's my job. It's their job. It's any other parent's job. It's not your job. It's your job to help us, to advocate to us, to work for a village, but it's our job at the end of the day. Miss Jada, I heard what you said. Again, believe it or not, I actually listened to everything. And you're absolutely right. While there's nothing on the uh, agenda to vote against a mask mandate, forgive hundreds of us who don't want to take your word for it. I will be leaving here. We have retained an attorney. Um, there is a lawsuit ready to go. This will be left here with y'all for all of y'all's records. You already have electronic copies. You didn't know who it was from until now. Um, let me just read the last sentence to everybody. It's my favorite sentence. If you do pass a mask policy, 
We will be immediately filing in court, signed Attorney Joshua Hooser. Just so you know, there are plaintiffs on standby, myself included, hundreds of others, and we will not take it anymore. I don't care if the vote's today, next week, five years from now. I told y'all in May that I would find a way to make this happen. Eight months later, I'm working on it. There's a lot more to come. Last step that I want to spend my last minute on, again, very different than normal. My suggestion as a parent, you don't have to agree, but these are my suggestions. They're also the suggestion of the attorney I spent an hour on the phone with yesterday. If your child is healthy and they're being quarantined and you want them in school, take them to school. They can't do anything. They can't touch your kids. They can't restrain your kids. If you want your child in school, take them to school. Say, excuse me, walk right by the person saying no. You have to do it. The attorney advises it. I, as my personal suggestion, I am not a lawyer, let me preface that, but that is what I would do and what I will be doing if and when a mask mandate ever comes down against the proviso. Thank y'all, I will leave this lovely demand letter from the attorney over here. Thank you, Ms. Berquist. Next we have uh, Nicole Lee McClendon. Uh, she lives in Lexington and has students that attend Meadow Glen Elementary and Middle. Hi, my name is Nicole and I'm a COVID infection control nurse and I have children in our community. I just wanna say thank you to the board and everyone for sending out the mask surveys, even though we can't do what the majority of um, the parents want in this community. I still appreciate that. Um, it makes me feel like as a community, at least people care and want to do the right thing, even though that right's been taken away from us. Um, and I just wanna say that I feel really sorry for the teachers and everyone who's been affected by COVID um, in our classrooms and who's been hospitalized. I wish we could use the masks as one of our best mitigators. Um, but our next best mitigator is the vaccines. Um, hopefully our elementary school kids will be able to get those soon. Um, but yeah, I do appreciate everything that you guys have done um, in trying to help our children. Um, and it showed me coming to this meeting that all of you do really care. You really care about our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McClendon. Next, we have Meredith Tosh Um She is a teacher in our district um, and teaches at Pelion High School. And um, she's going to speak to us. Oh, she has her handouts. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. My name is Meredith Toshkandi, and I am a teacher here in Lex One. I'm here to advocate for a clear contingency plan moving forward through the pandemic. Over the summer, we were hopeful. We saw numbers decrease, and we were hoping for a normal school year. However, hope is not a strategy. In the first four weeks of school, our cases soared. On September 10th, 41.1% of my school's student population was excluded, and we were still not virtual. I have been asking, what is the threshold to go virtual? The most common responses have been, we're looking into it, we don't know, or we're optimistic that these cases will decrease. However, optimism is not a plan. Last year, we had a direct plan backed by data, this year, the proposed plan seems to be, we encourage students to wear masks and to be vaccinated if eligible. Those are hopes, not strategies. We are lacking a clear cut plan with consistent mitigation strategies on how to handle percentage thresholds based on expert recommendations. Dr. Guyton, you spoke very passionately um, about the things that we are unable to do. And I would like for us to focus on the things that we can do. Our current plan gives school activities for low, moderate, and high community spread, but most of the strategies listed are either aimed at elementary schools only 
or are not consistently implemented. The plan is vague, including statements such as virtual meetings recommended and schools may choose for school students to eat in the classroom. In regards to instructional model shifts, all it says is when deciding if and when to shift to virtual learning, we will consider what impacts the fewest possible number of students. There is much left up to interpretation and it leaves teachers, staff, and families frustrated and confused. We need strict protocols that are consistent district-wide. We need to utilize all mitigation strategies at our disposal. In the packet that I have given you, I have listed concerns with Lex One's current protocols along with potential solutions, including mitigation strategies that we are not currently using at all or that are being used incorrectly or that are uh, being used inconsistently. I've also included a side-by-side -side comparison between our plan and Lex Rich 5's levels of mitigation guide. It has five levels of mitigation with clearly stated percentage thresholds and includes specific mitigation measures for each level. However, their levels of mitigation is based on positive cases only, not total exclusions. We need to formulate our plan based on totals excluded because the accommodations teachers are making are for all students excluded, not just positive cases. Please create a detailed plan with specific percentage thresholds and mitigation measures so we can keep our schools, students, and faculty safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tushkandi. All right, next we have Dana Holmesley, um, and she lives in Lexington. She has a student in kindergarten at Lexington Elementary, and she is going to speak about board accountability. Madam Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Little, I come before you all tonight to not only address the board, but the community members of the public. I sat for every board meeting since May, and over the course of five months, I have seen just how divisive these meetings are and how divided our community has gotten over certain hot topic issues. Um, but in all honesty, I'm not here to talk about the mask issue. I believe it's bigger than just masks or vac vaccines. I believe it lies with our district school board and their lack of transparency and accountability. Since attending these meetings, I have observed the conduct and behavior of the board. I've also sent several emails pointing out certain issues that I'm seeing, a lot of times only receiving feedback from the same two board members. I recently received a FOIA request for the chairwoman's emails over the course of, the, of a year. I'm not done coming through all the emails, but I did find within the emails, it absolutely disappointed me. I further emailed the board those findings. For example, Ms. Green forwarded an email from a citizen to her husband with an eye roll emoji. Dr. Guyton asked for a forum for, forum for community input for ESSER funds, and Ms. Green explains why that isn't feasible. There are meetings that include two board officers, Ms. Green, Dr. Powers, along with the COO and the superintendent, discuss items such as an agenda setting and budget processes, and another discussion where the details were redacted that included arrangements to have Dr. Powers attend a meeting by phone. Most all correspondence that come to Ms. Green is forwarded to the superintendent and COO, and sometimes Dr. Powers, but almost never with other board members. In at least one instance, presentations for a board meeting are shared with Ms. Green days before they are shared with other board members. Ms. Green forwards an email from Ms. Garris to the COO. The COO provides talking points to Ms. Green the same COO tells Ms. Green that he has provided the information Ms. Garris is requesting multiple times. However, when, Mr. Gu when Dr. Guyton, excuse me, requested the same information a month earlier, the superintendent told Dr. Guyton that, all st that they are all still working on getting the information and it should be ready within a month. Information was provided for changing the guidelines for community participation during the time citizens began actively participating. The board does not operate as one. Board votes are being made without board members being privy to the information. The lack of respect for the community is not just imagined, but very real for our board chair and vice chair. The agenda is not being set according to policy. Ms. O'Kane granted an extension without mutual agreement, which is required by the Freedom of Information Act. And according to the response letter I received from the district, out of 15,700 emails that were identified, only 2,600 were produced. While certain information is allowed, not required to be redacted, the district is requ required to produce line by line their reasons for redaction. Instead, the district determined that, and I quote, many of these were unsolicited advertisements, 
offers of service, et cetera, AKA spam, which I did not think you were interested in. I am not providing those emails. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Hensley. Next we have Ms. Ivalisa Ortiz. She lives in Lexington and has students uh, that attend Pleasant Hill Elementary and Pleasant Hill Middle. Good evening. This is my third meeting uh, addressing the board. Um, the first time that I came, I came after my children have one of my boys had complained about the usage of masks and the adverse effects that he was having in his ability to be able to function. And the headaches and the inability to focus, his inability to properly perform in school, the exhaustion. Now, everything I've seen today, you know, we received that email about the survey. I feel the survey, but I believe that the whole thing has been deceiving. Now, you can say that we are going to set standards for whenever to put mass mandates whenever we have high community spread. Well, how do we define how community a high community spread? How do we define if the cases are real cases and not just positive tests? How do you know that the positive test means actual illness? Is any of this defined? No, it's not. Now, if you go back and look at the national data for COVID deaths among children since the beginning of the pandemic, I'm not talking about now. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the number of deaths listed in the chart, they say less than five for zero to four, less than five for five to eight, less than five for 10 to 14, eight for 15 to 19. Why are we putting our children through all of this when they are really, there is no data that actually proves that this needs to be implemented? First of all, what are the symptoms of these children? How many of them have had severe cases of COVID? How many of them just had two or three days of a cold and were fine? You see, one of my children missed 14 days of school because of a close contact. That's the same kid that is unable to, party, to wear a mask. So now my kid, which is the one that has an IED in the books, is the one that had to be at home for 14 days. And he's the one that needs the teacher the most. Now, where are we going to draw the line? You know, now it's mass. Next, what is? Now they approved the five to 11 year old group for vaccines. Are you going to tell me that I cannot decide if my child should be vaccinated or not? Are you going to tell me that my children, that I don't get to decide what is best for my children because the board gets to decide that if my child is seen as a threat, he shouldn't be in the classroom. We need to be a little more realistic on the, on the way we are addressing all of this. Thank you, Ms. Ortiz. Next we have Ms. Catherine Reynolds. She lives in Lexington. Um, and I, I believe her st children are in Lula. Are they in Lula? Oh, they're, okay. okay. Um, I've had asked other people, is there anything that you need me to say? And so I'm just going to read a couple of these. It says, I plan to speak about the numbers going down, that healthy children are being denied education of the absurd pro protocols. I also wanted to address how Powers said that it was an attack on the school board when actually it's an attack on the parents' right. I wanted them to know 
that we are watching and we expect them to do their jobs and we will vote them out. That's just one of the parents. There's other parents, there's other teachers. There's teachers that I know personally and they are so tired of the protocols. They are tired of the way that they are required to teach. There's parents, there's teachers that are out there that are having trouble with morally making decisions. Will I be forgiven by teaching these children this? And then there's, and who is in charge of this education? Who is in charge of all this curriculum? Because honestly, I pulled my kids. My children are now homeschooled. Why? Because I had made the decision that they, the school cannot provide consistency right now. And that is a huge concern for me because my children's education means way more than this power hungry game. And honestly, I was sad, I am sad, because there are so many educational gaps that this has been pushed for. Uh, you go and the testing, and that's what you guys are trying to push and push and push on the testing, and so many other things. Basic, basic, go back to basics. These kids are spelling phonetically. How? Why are these children game spelling phonetically when you guys have a great, report card. Why is that happening? I don't understand that. You know, get back to basics. These kids need a quality education, not know how to learn how to pass tests. I don't like that. You know, I teach my children that we retain. If I need to take an extra week to teach my child something, guess what? I have the freedom to do that. You guys push and push and push and push these kids to go through. Why do you think the math numbers are going down? That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Next, we have Tony Colson. Um, he lives in Lexington and has a student that attends River Bluff. Thanks for the opportunity to share my perspective as it relates to the mask mandate. And I understand that we're not voting there tonight, but I also feel a sense of urgency from the board to consider that. And so it seems plausible that if you follow the science that you should be able to wear a mask and that would protect you and those around you. However, I would challenge this perspective being as simple as face value. It's not A plus B equals C. In other words, it's not clear to me that wearing a mask in a non-surgical environment where the setting cannot be controlled is optimal protecting against COVID virus, and it may in effect actually be detrimental in some cases. Plus the mask up solution doesn't take into consideration multiple other risk and harm that our children are being exposed to as a result of wearing the mask for long periods of time over an extended period. Let me explain by just sharing my own personal story. My daughter, who is 12 years old, or was 12 years old at the time of diagnosis with type one diabetes in February of 2020, right before COVID hit. Immediately, we had to begin to do life with a chronically ill child who up to that point was our healthiest. We followed the recommendations on how to keep our daughter safe. And one of those recommendations were mask in school. For the following year, my daughter went to school with a mask on and suffered severely with high glucose levels. We thought this was just the normal part of being type one. However, we were amazed that the day, the very next day after the mask mandate was lifted and she was able to remove her mask, we went from dealing with sugar levels of 300 and 400 on a regular basis to amazingly now having to monitor for low sugar levels. With the mask on, her health suffered. She stayed behind in school of constantly being delayed of testing. She missed day after day because of her sugar levels and the impact had an overall negative impact. The difficulty of trying to learn from a teacher who's masked up in a room full of other mass students was demoralizing and defeating for her educational process. Today, she's doing much better without a mask on. Her health is better. Her emotional well-being is better. And in a setting with no mask, her ability to learn is better. She is happier, she is healthier, and she feels better. 
wearing the mask has and will create a long-term impact on our children's health, physically, emotionally, psychologically, socially, educationally, that should be of an equal and perhaps more significant concern as, of, as it is the concern of COVID. I know of children who are wearing the mask not because of a fear of COVID, but because of a fear of showing their face. This is not a behavior that we want to promote and cultivate in our children. Freedom, stewardship, and responsibility is the right path. Fear-mongering mandates and an imbalanced approach towards science is not. Thank you, Mr. Colson. Next, we have Danielle Bowers. Ms. Bowers lives in Lexington and has students that attend Lake Murray, Beechwood, and Lexington High. Um, first, I wanna say, um, like Ms. Berquist said, um, addressing Ms. Green, you said that it's your job and it's your responsibility to take care of our children. It's not, it's us as parents. We are the parents. I think that is getting lost in translation here that I am their parent. I'm here to decide what is best for them mentally, physically, emotionally. You are here to be educators and to educate in the things that have been set forth. That is not your duty to take care of my child. You do not know the things that I have dealt with physically or with with their health. You cannot do that to parents. It is not your responsibility. But in, in essence, what I want to speak more about is freedom. And it's freedom from all the things that you guys are, are taking away from us and that you think that you are entitled to. Um, an educated citizenry knows the lessons of history. They draw parallels between past tyranny tyranny, and what is happening today. And educated people stand for freedom because they understand when you reduce freedom from some, you reduce freedom for all. We are at a turning point in history. What happens in our state and especially on the, in our country and on a world stage now will drastically change our future. It's time to turn, his, to, turn to history. Read the accounts. Don't go to the textbooks or Wikipedia. Listen to the people who have lived through this. Those who suffered under tyranny when life, liberty, and property were taken away. When we do that, we can see the similarities of what has happened then and what is happening now. I've read stories of Anne Frank, Eli Wiesel, Martin Luther King Jr., and Jesus Christ. I've thought, why didn't more people say anything? Why didn't they stand up? Today, I understand. It was fear, isolation, bullying, and threats, all things that we have experienced here. Um, from our school board and superintendents telling us that we should be worried, we should take more concern, we should do this and that. And it was fear being placed in us. Um, and if we do not wear a mask over our face, that we will surely die. Only a few got on the Mayflower, only a few stood up for Jesus Christ, only a few stood firm against the British in the Revolutionary War, and only a few went to stop the war, uh, went to war to stop Hitler. Only a few took action to promote civil rights for all. When hearing this, what side of history do you want to be standing on? The following quote is from Oliver DeMille. 15 years from now or sometime close to that, each of us will have to look our children and grandchildren in the eyes and tell them that we presided over the greatest loss of freedom in history or that we took action to bring back freedom, that we will send them home to live their lives, then we will send them home to live their lives of freedom or not. In the Bible, um, we're told by Jesus Christ to fear not because living in fear of something like a virus that the majority of us, 99%, can recover from is not helping us. I am not glorifying my God when I fear anyone or anything other than him. Let me leave you with a question. How, as a superintendent and school board, are you standing for freedom? Thank you, Ms. Bowers. Next, we have Tripp Bowers. Tripp is a student at Lake Murray Elementary. My name is Tripp Bowers, and I spoke at the meeting back in May. I am grateful Governor McMaster made it a law that you can't force me to wear a mask. At the end of last year, it was nice for students to have the choice if they want to wear a mask. I like seeing my friends' faces. And it ha has been great this year to see my principals and teachers' faces I can hear them better without the mask and I don't get headaches anymore. I understand some people are scared and some people want to wear them and that is okay. 
for them to feel that way and make that choice for themselves. But is that a good reason to take away my right to choose? I also understand the school district will get lots more money if we all wear them. So you have motivation for our COVID numbers to be high and so we have to wear masks and kind of like how doctors aren't always motivated to get you healthy. They don't make money when you are healthy. If masks actually work, they wouldn't, my friend who wears a mask would be safe even if I don't wear a mask. And if my friend isn't safe because of their mask, why is anyone wearing a mask? Shouldn't doctors be encouraging us to eat healthy, exercise, and take vitamins? I haven't he heard the schools share this with me. I think it, if we stop forcing masks and encourage those things, we would all be healthier. I also think you are teaching my friends and and I to not to be kind of understanding when someone makes a different choice than us. My parents have taught me about empathy. It is to understand someone else's point of view. That doesn't mean we agree, but we can respect and understand we all have different opinions. I'm okay with my friends who choose to wear a mask, even though I disagree, but I can look past their mask and see all the good things they have to offer. From this time for us, please make the choice to follow the laws in our state and constitution. Thank you, Tripp, good job. Next we have Ms. Rebecca Godfrey and she lives in Lexington. I understand why the district followed DHEC guidelines last year because there were a lot of unknowns, but now I think it's time to question DHEC. Are we following them just because they told us to? Do you know who funds the CDC which DHEC submits to? Bill Gates, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Merck. The makers of the jab are funding the CDC, which in turn is strongly recommending the jab. This is a huge conflict of interest. Pfizer's up $33 billion this year, now wants to push a booster. Are you going to require the booster for every vaxxed kid or teacher to maintain their vax status? What if DHEC says to get a booster every five months? Are you going to subscribe to that just because DHEC wants you to? It's time to question their authority and motivation. Also, did you know that hospitals consider anyone who got the jab as unvaccinated if 14 days haven't passed since their second shot? 80% of re adverse reactions happen within the first 14 days of the shot. So the patients the hospital is calling unvaxxed could very well have gotten two shots. And on May 1st, the CDC decided to quit recording the vast majority of breakthrough case of cases for vaxxed people. It's all quite misleading, and you are using this data to make a case for more masks and more jabs. You say you want to keep kids in school, but you are using the most ineffective and unproven method. Why are you sending healthy kids home at a rate of 10 healthy kids to one positive kid? You're creating the problem. Only 1% to 2% of the kids are positive, and you exclude 23%. This policy is completely contrary to any logic. If you want schools to stay open, let healthy kids come to school. Quit sending healthy teachers home, too. Healthy teachers are having to teach via Zoom with a substitute sitting in their seat. No wonder we're having shortages of subs. This is nonsense. And contact tracing. Contact tracing is discriminatory. Each time a healthy, unjabbed kid's, kid gets sent home due to contact tracing, they lose up to 70 hours of in-person instruction, playing time in sports, rehearsal time in the arts, access to teachers, and community of the student body compared to the jabbed kid who isn't quarantined, even if there's a positive person in his family. How can you justify this? Both jabbed and unjabbed can catch and transmit COVID. You are completely discriminating against the kids who do not want to be part of this human experiment and who have the moral courage to not violate their own conscience. You should be ashamed of yourself from pressuring or guilting any minor in this way. My prediction of how this will end if we don't break from this policy, DHEC is making the numbers look as bad as possible until everyone reaches this point of desperation and misery and just gets the jab to get their golden ticket to freedom. 
until they are considered unvaccinated when the booster comes out, or they have a life-altering adverse reaction. This is extremely short-sighted and unwise. Please spend more time educating all of your students and less time discriminating against and dividing kids. Let the teachers and students be sovereign over their own bodies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Godfrey. Next, we have Melissa Kraps. Uh, she lives in Lexington and has a student that attends Lexington Elementary. I wanted to thank Mr. Oswald for letting us go through Gilbert this past summer. I appreciate it. Um, good evening. My name is Melissa Kraps. I have two kids currently going to Lexington Elementary School. This past summer, when Governor McMaster signed the mask mandate ban, I was relieved. Um, I thought for a moment that we, the fight was over, yet here we are. Um, I really don't think y'all should have sent that out last week. Um, it's the fifth week of school and we're having to push back. I thought the mask order was pretty clear. If a parent wants their child in a mask, they will send them to school with one. So why would they need a school board to tell them what to do? If in fact 69% of the parents in our school district wanted their child in a mask, then 69% of kids in schools would be masked. You could have a better system in place for the survey for the parents. I think um, the numbers were kind of off a little bit. Why are we following these crazy quarantine measures? Do they really work? Has anybody started to do studies on this? I also had a healthy child sitting at home for two weeks. At one point in August, there were seven kids positive in my child's school, or my, I have two kids in the school now. Um, but anyway, there were seven positive COVID cases. Out of the seven positive COVID cases, 147 kids had to quarantine. I wonder if out of all of those kids that quarantined, how many actually became positive after that? Um, I think at one point, the highest cases in the, my child's school was 14, so 2% of 648 students were COVID positive, but then we had like 20% out. Um, I got curious and started to wonder how other countries are dealing with their children. I found out that the United Kingdom has never had a mask mandate for their children 12 and under. The United Kingdom Department of Education on August 17th completely got rid of the mask for the whole school system. Um, and they, they said that our priority is for face-to-face -face and high-quality education to all pupils. They also said as COVID-19 becomes a virus that we learn to live with, there is now an imperative to reduce the disruption to children. I mean, we need to find a way to like, get out of the DHEC guidelines. Because, I mean, sending home six, 7,000 kids that aren't even sick. It's just, I don't know, it's ridiculous to me. Um, why do y'all continue to push the use of masks in school? If, if you want your kid to wear a mask, they can wear a mask. If we don't, you don't. Um, I want my children to grow up with the same school experience that I had. I want them to make friends, laugh, and have fun together, to see people's facial expressions when they interact with them. I also want to add that we are not some kind of crazy group of parents. We want what's best for our children. If so many people in our district want mask mandates, where are they at? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kreps. Next, we have Michael Brown. Uh, Mr. Brown lives in Lexington and has students that attend Pleasant Hill Elementary and Middle Schools. Thanks for having us out here to, uh, tonight. And I uh, appreciate all the comments uh, from Mr. Guyton and uh, Ms. Green uh, about, you know, caring about our kids, wanting what's best for them. That, that's what it, we all want, too. We just sometimes disagree on what that is. Um, I would like to just say for a minute that, uh, you know, the COVID uh, cases in kids is, you know, so small and so insignificant, but we spend such a large amount of money and time discussing it and worrying about it. Uh, I really wish we could devote some of those resources that we're spending and uh, some of this time that we're spending in other avenues that would uh, help further our kids' education. I think that uh, we're spinning our wheels and, and focusing on such a minute problem. Uh, I, I get that COVID is, is real, it's a problem, but it's 
it's the, the amount of time we've spent on it is uh, just crazy. Um, secondly, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, my kids. My kids are on quarantine, um, you know, healthy, no problems right now. Uh, and I noticed that on there we talked about, or they showed the 7%. I thought that was really interesting because I think a lot of parents have wondered, you know, about their kids. So many kids have been sent home that don't turn out to be sick. Uh, and there again, we're talking about the 7% uh, that did, but there's 93% on the other side of that coin that's being sent home and that's losing uh, really important educational time. Uh, I've got an 11-year-old who, um, yeah, I'm getting emails from his teacher saying that he's missing some of his Zoom things and things like that. So today I decided I was going to sit with him and make sure that it all got done correctly. Uh, you know, he's just sitting there waiting for the session to begin, uh, and it never begins. Like, so uh, we've had that issue, and then my daughter was on a Zoom. She's in second grade, and um, the teacher couldn't hear her. So she's sitting there trying to uh, express that she doesn't know what they're, uh, she's getting lost in the trans, you know, they're, they're running from window to window and highlighting things and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of work to it that, you know, if it was a regular uh, highlighter and a regular piece of paper, I'm sure she wouldn't have had any issue, but, you know, she's getting lost in that and she couldn't uh, express that to the teacher because the teacher couldn't hear her. And, uh, I mean, she just sat there for 20, 30 minutes, so frustrated, crying, you know, and I'm trying to help her out, uh, but honestly, I'm not that tech savvy either with all these tablets and zooming and highlighting and stuff like that. Uh, I just wish that we'd take this time uh, and focus on what we can do to actually progress their education. They, they need this, and they're losing so much time. We're so focused on the small things, you know, um, and we're wasting our time and resources on that, in my opinion. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next, we have Nicole Donahue. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Um, and she lives in Lexington and has students that attend White Knoll Elementary and White Knoll Middle. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm a graduate of Lexington One. I have two, two kids in Lexington One also. Um, so to say that we're invested in this area is an understatement. But I'm, I'm here tonight to shed light on what I think is a deficiency. Lexington One has been missing the point for a little bit, and I'll bring that full circle in a minute. The initial COVID shutdown was difficult and scary, and so we, all, we did kind of, everybody did the best they could to manage during that time, but my children did not receive an education from Lexington One, and they don't now when they're quarantined. No learning takes place on a Chromebook or iPad. Those kids are learning from the school of mom and dad. But here we are a year and a half later, and we're still quarantining kids the same way we did a year ago, all close contacts, all 14 days. Additionally, now schools are shut down when too many have been quarantined, not when too many have positive test results. My children have unnecessarily missed many weeks of school and after school activities to these quarantines. In December of 2020, the district sent out an email that said it would adhere to the new CDC guideline of seven day quarantines with a negative COVID test after day five. And that has been adapted in private and charter schools successfully, but that policy has never been observed at my children's schools. My children have been quarantined even though they wore masks, sat behind plexiglass, and even after they had immunity to COVID. The quarantine of healthy children has to stop. We're denying them an education. I'll continue my story about missing the point. Um, recently, a reluctant but bright straight-A honor student was not called to the office when the junior scholars were announced. A parent called about it the next week, and it turns out the student was just inadvertently left off the, off the list. So the student was told in the hall, hey, you don't have to pay to take the test, which, as you may know, is a perk of being a junior scholar. The student had no idea what that meant, so his parents later explained to him that he had been named to the Junior Scholar Program and that it was an honor. In that situation, the school missed the point. That student does not care about taking a test or whether his parents pay $18 for it or not, but here was the perfect opportunity to give a fist bump to an otherwise reluctant student, to acknowledge excellence in the classroom and to say good job. In the same way, I feel like now Lexington One is missing the point. We are too busy surveying about masks and excessively quarantining healthy children to realize we are letting excellence slip out the back door. By the way, that student is my son and I am proud of him. Tonight, I beg you to stop focusing on masks and quarantines and vaccines for a virus that we know is not dangerous for children. 
Please stop missing the point and focus on excellence. Viruses have been around for hundreds of years, but these kids will only be ours for a little while. We have to learn to live with COVID. Kids need to be in school. Please stop quarantining the healthy and masking the beauty of their faces. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Miriam Fleshman. Ms. Fleshman lives in Lexington and has a student that attends River Bluff. Dr. Peter McCullough, who is a board certified internist, a board certified cardiologist, an editor of two major publications. He has over, over 45 publications in peer reviewed literature. He spent the last 18 months studying COVID and reviewing thousands of reports and talks and speaks with um, many doctors nationally. This is what he had to say, and I quote him. First, the virus does not transmit asymptomatically. That means only a sick person can give it to somebody else. This idea that we have to wear masks or go into lockdown for kids that are perfectly well does not accomplish anything because they are not sick. Again, the virus does not transmit asymptomatically. Even the World Health Organization, as of June 25th, stated no more asymptomatic testing in fact, there are no tests that the FDA cleared to use, to be used for, as for asymptomatic testing because it does not spread asymptomatically. I went through and did a lot of research on this, and I wanna quote a couple of publications that have come out recently. A large randomized control trial, trial with close to 8,000 participants published in October of last year one found that face masks did not seem to be effective against laboratory confirmed viral respiratory infections nor against clinical respiratory infections if you guys remember back in the 19, 1918 influenza pandemic the use of face masks among the general population was widespread and in some places mandatory but they made no difference we need to trust the science we need to be critical thinkers and look at the science and not politics. On April 2020, review by two US professors in respiratory and infectious disease from the University of Illinois concluded that face masks have no effect in everyday life, neither as self-protection nor protect third parties, the source, the source, the source control. Um, another one. Uh, May, in May a 20, in 2020, meta, a meta study on pandemic influenza published by the US CDC found that face masks had no effect neither as personal protective equipment nor as a source control. I know the board may get control in the future, who knows, but I am absolutely against masks. They do not do anything. Thank you. Next, we have Janine Connor. Um, Ms. Connor lives in Lexington and has students that attend River Bluff and Lexington Middle. Hi, good evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I wasn't aware that there wasn't going to be a vote on the mask, so a lot of what I have to say is about the mask. I'm honestly not sure what the purpose of the survey was then for the masks. Um, anyway, we are new to the district and new to South, South Carolina. Uh, we have a son in high school and a daughter in middle school. We moved here a month ago after leaving New York and our family and friends in hopes of a better quality of life and to enjoy the freedoms that South Carolina has to offer. I was asked by some of our new friends here to share my perspective with masking kids in school based on our experiences last year in New York. After much debate last year, uh, my husband and I decided that our children would opt to learn virtually. The idea of children wearing masks for seven hours a day and distancing from their peers and teachers was not an option for us, particularly since there had been no valid data on the success of mask wearing in preventing the spread of COVID. With online learning, their grades plummeted along with their spirit. However, friends and family who kept their children remained in school masked had their own set of frightening challenges. These children struggled with various psychological, social, emotional issues, including social anxiety, panic attacks, eating disorders because they were afraid to remove their masks, 
during lunch, along with feelings of isolation due to lack of peer communication and even suicide. Last, uh, sadly, the CDC itself cites a study sharing the rise in ER visits for suicide attempts among children ages 12 to 25 between January 2019 and May of 2021, which I can give the board um, the information. In addition to being a parent, I'm also an early childhood special educator. I work with children ages three to six until March, or did work, until March of 2020, when the schools were shut down due to COVID. When asked to return the following September, I was told that both teachers and young students were required to wear masks. This included children with varying learning abilities, such as speech delays, sensory processing disorders, ADHD, and autistic spectrum disorders, to name a few. As a special educator, I cannot stress enough the importance of facial expression for effective communication and for children for successfully experience, to successfully experience social reciprocity. Seeing their faces and mouths was and is particularly important for young learners. Needless to say, I did not return to my job. Furthermore, there are report after report, 10 of which I will include and give to the board, um, in which masks are clearly not effective in preventing the transmission. Um, in a recent board meeting in Comac, New York, Dr. Richard Emerling states that no masks, that masks do not prevent the viral spread and can cause skin infections, dental infections, more frequent upper respiratory. Lastly, the masks, in, in, if you're considering the mask in, in school, please take into consideration the cases in our county and some of the schools that are rapidly dropping. I urge you not to make the same mistakes that we made in New York, where the kids are told to mask up to flatten the curve and they're still masked today as the numbers are rising. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Connor. Next, we have uh, Benjamin Joseph Hughes. Mr. Hughes lives in Lexington and has students that attend uh, Lexington and Beachwood, Lexington High and Beachwood. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I was only coming to sit in and somebody asked me out front if I wanted to speak. And I was like, yes. So initially I was coming in here to talk about masks and the survey. Well, by listening to the chair lady speak tonight, y'all know y'all's roles when it comes to masks, which is good. You know the role where we got to learn how to live with COVID. Great. What are we going to do moving forward? It's not going anywhere because you can't contain a virus. I also wanted to speak on this survey. The fact that you knew you couldn't do anything about it and sent the survey, just telling me you're throwing anarchy on your own system. You're using my children for money, these children for money, and y'all need to get it together. And that's all I got to say. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Next, we have uh, Susan Cosker Yates, and Ms. Yates lives in Lexington and has a student that attends River Bluff High School. Is Ms. Yates here? Okay, I, I've, I've pulled those out. We'll put Ms. Yates aside, and if she's down the hall and we'll comes check. in. We'll check, I will check. Maybe All right, we'll while, we're, wait, while we're finding her, um, we'll go ahead and go to uh, Ms. Irene Bearwald. Uh, Ms. Bearwald lives in Lexington. They might both show up at the same time. All right. All right. Madison Rogers, come on down. I'm not sure where they are. I think they might be in the overflow room. Sorry. All right, is that Miss Yates? Yes. Yeah, okay. And then next, Miss McPhail, we have Miss Bearwald and Madison Rogers are ne up next. 
All right, yeah, Ms. Yates, take, take it away. Sorry. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Susan Yates. Um, I've actually emailed all of y'all about, um, about the masks and my opinion on the lack of local control. Um, I'm very surprised that this state, who is always about local control, local problems, local issues, local control, is so happy that the state government and is, is actually doing this requirement of no mask. You can't require a mask. I understand that most of the people that are here are um, against a mask mandate. And they are, as the survey showed, in the minority. Um, most of the people that I know, yes, most of the people that I know that are for local control are afraid to come into this place. They're afraid that they're gonna get COVID. They're afraid that they're gonna get harassed by the minority. But I feel that it's important to be here. And um, I appreciate your time. I will continue to contact my, the governor, Chris Wooten, Ronnie Cromer, and whoever else that I need to, to urge them to change the rules and regulations. If you see something that's wrong, then you need to go forward and, and push forward. And I understand that the people that are here with, that don't want masks are doing the exact same thing. Um, the, the issue is we are continuing to have issues in our schools with people that aren't masking and people that aren't getting vaccines and people that don't want to quarantine and they don't want to do anything to mitigate any of this. And I just don't understand how a community that is supposed to look out for everybody else is so against helping the people that are vulnerable. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yates. Next we have Ms. Irene Bearwald. Ms. Bearwald lives in Lexington and has students in Lula and at the LTC. Hello. So I'm one of those weird parents who've been helping and involved with my kids' education ever since they were in elementary school. School's just going to get rid of me. So I have a thought for teacher and staff appreciation who are out on COVID because of HIPAA rules. Of course, I don't expect as a community member to know who's out. But I was wondering if the district had considered an Instacart staples cart for any of those who may go out on leave, where maybe parents can donate so those teachers or even families don't have to leave. It's like a, you know, I can still love on you while I'm not touching you kind of thing. So that's my um, idea for teacher appreciation. Um, I kind of also know my lane as a parent and I find it very ironic <laughs> that we are complaining now about things that are being, that have been always happened. We've got psychologists in our schools. We have teachers and nurses who have to look out for physical abuse and whether or not children are being neglected at home. We have therapists who do occupational therapy and physical therapy at schools. Our schools don't just teach anymore and they don't just teach anymore because our parents didn't take on those roles at home. So if you are a good parent, fantastic. But there are a lot of parents out there that of course, rely on schools to feed them. Because how many times during when we were all closed down did people say kids need to be in schools because nobody can see if they're being abused at home. These kids aren't being fed. Nobody can see if they need any type of IEPs or educational work. So obviously, schools are doing more than just educating our children. So as a parent who loves her teachers, 
I will send my kid to school and I will make sure that they follow the dress code in that school. If that means that I say, put your hands down by your side, let me see where your shorts hit. It doesn't matter if I agree with it. I don't want her to be sent home. Or if my son goes to school in flip-flops, I'm sorry, you can't do that, even if your friend goes to school in flip-flops because the school's dress code says you can't. It's a dress code we're teaching them rights and responsibilities for when they get older and they have jobs. How many of us had jobs, our first jobs were in food service, movie theaters, places where we had to wear a uniform, where there was a level of expectation of dress, whether that was a face covering, because you worked in food service, and so you had to prevent from spitting or having a hairnet on. These are just things that you have to do in certain situations. You don't have to like them, you can work to change them. But if anything, we should be teaching our children the responsibility of this is how you act in an environment until change occurs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beerwald. Next we have Madison Rogers. Uh, Ms. Rogers lives in Lexington and has a student that attends New Providence. Hey everyone, thanks for letting us speak tonight. Um, so there's been a lot of back and forth for the past year and a half, unfortunately, and we are no closer to respecting each other's position in this community, and it's very unsettling and it's disheartening. I and these other parents and guardians are not trying to take anything away from anyone. I am and we all are simply trying with desperation to retain our rights for the care and treatment of our own children to the best of my abilities in the way that my husband and I see as best suited to our beliefs and wisdom given to us by God. I'm sorry that this community, this country, and this world have taken the path of passing judgment and condemnation and even resorting to threats to one side or the other simply because our choices in healthcare differ. Um, we shouldn't be manipulating each other. We shouldn't be trying to skirt the laws or find ways to force one agenda or another on each other, ever. Our children are figuratively being thrown in a pit and fought over, and it's just disgusting. Um, I'm just disheartened that we are and that I am still here discussing who has authority over children who have my DNA, no one else's. Um, and so I ask that you not submit this resolution to the General Assembly. Just don't continue the division that this argument creates. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Next, we have Nicole Water. Um, she lives in Leesville and has a student that attends Centerville. Yes, I just wanted to discuss, um, just for example, last year my daughter was in kindergarten um, and she did have to wear a mask. So um, I did express concern to the school and even reached out to the district. Um, I asked about different exemptions, medical, um, even religious exemptions was shut down, not really um, given any other options with that. And then um, I even reached out to Molly Spearman um, uh, talking about my concerns. And she said that my daughter actually should have been eligible to not have to wear a mask. Um, so I sent that to the district, um, called, emailed, never got a response. So I was ignored. Um, so as far as the board wanting to have more authority, um, doesn't really make me feel comfortable knowing that I wasn't even responded to. And um, she just had to continue to abide by what their standards were at that point. Um, my daughter also was um, at uh, online for two weeks. Um, she was part of the Centerville crowd, um, healthy, and she cried several times. She's in the Spanish immersion program because um, she couldn't understand her teacher. I couldn't really help her. Um, so it was just very frustrating. Um, so again, I, just this whole quarantine, the 10 to one thing, of um, making our kids stay at home. I have friends that are about to lose their job because they keep quarantining because of close contact. Um, Lexington Medical Center, if unless you have symptoms, you can't, you can't just leave work. So um, just focus on educating our children, I think is the biggest thing. So thanks. A teacher in Lexington and has a student at Pleasant Hill Elementary. All right, um, 
So I want to start tonight by addressing Dr. Powers, um, the transitions. They were very difficult from a teacher's perspective. Um, <laughs> I had two kids that were quarantined back to back and it was tough. I think when I first found out I was in the middle of a lesson and I got the phone call thinking it was my, my neighboring teacher and I, instead it was the nurse. And I held back tears long enough for me to walk to the bathroom because I am blessed with one of the rooms that has a bathroom right there. And I broke down. The reality is I knew it was coming because it, it was inevitable. But at the same time, I'm, I'm proud to say that I am a teacher here in the district that understood the flexibility of the situation. I already had my manipulatives ready for my kids. I'm a CC3 teacher. We don't do paper and pencil. I don't do online, here's a PDF, finish it. It was all manipulatives. I had boxes ready. I had binders ready. I had their iPads ready, ready to go. I had to teach from home and thank goodness I had wonderful IAs because it was tough. And parents, whatever side you're on, I, we all get it. It's tough being a parent and a teacher, teaching from home, working from home, it's tough. But at the same time, I'm very grateful for that opportunity because my kids were kept safe. In the day of me as a teacher, in the first five weeks, I had somebody in my classroom missing. I have five staff members. Someone was missing for the first five weeks of school. And that's really tough when you're given the opportunity to come to class the, the eight, August 9th, all right, because of construction. As a special ed teacher, that's very difficult to set up the first day of school with professional development and everything. If I can make it through, we all can. I understand students learn at different uh, areas and different variabilities. I mean, I hate the mask as much as anyone else because as, as another special ed teacher was saying, you don't get the social emotional from those kids. I had, I had a trouble with my own kids in my classroom with the mask on, but at the end of the day, if I ever transmitted this, this virus to one of them, my guilt would be so detrimental to my teaching style. Um, to, and to end, because I'm, I'm, I'm seeming to ramble on right now, it's a long night, I wanted to say thank you to um, Dr. Little and, and Nurse Amy Wood. I saw what you guys were um, discussing t this afternoon at the conference. And I, I thank the district for advocating for the safety of the students, because in reality, as much as we all hate it, we need, we need something else in, in place. So hopefully you guys can get this Provisio uh, 1.108 uh, switched around. Thank you, Ms. Pellington. Next we have Kelly Buck. Ms. Buck lives in Gilbert and has students that attend Gilbert High and White Knoll Middle. Hi, um, I have a son at Gilbert High and a stepdaughter at White Knoll Middle. Um, I did not bring any statistics and I don't have any numbers to share because everybody can look them up on whatever website or politicians site that you believe. I've been a nurse for 11 years. My husband has been a paramedic for 17. We have been in this pandemic from the beginning, what everyone calls the front lines, but they're not the front lines anymore. They're the places where people go to die. And I know that, and I see people laughing at me now and it's okay, it's okay. I am glad that everyone in this room has not had to see what I have. And I'm going to share this with you, even though it goes against my beliefs, but we vote Republican. But my children need to be safe. I understand special needs. I understand that this is uncomfortable, but this is for your benefit and not mine. I understand if you don't want to get vaccinated, and that is your right. But just like the school makes your kids wear shoes, it's okay to wear a mask. 
There are no health. You can look up whatever you want, but if you believe that this mask is going to, you know, eventually make you dumber or more unhealthy or something like that, then why have you ever had surgery? Because your surgeon wears one all day. I don't understand the lack of compassion in people, honestly, because this doesn't hurt me and it doesn't hurt you. But I have an entire tower of the hospital, more than a third of it, that is full of people dying from COVID. And I know people think that if you test positive, they hospitalize you. Or, oh, how many of those people came for something else and just happened to test positive? I've taken care of dozens, maybe hundreds of COVID patients. One came in for something else and is an test positive and we sent her home the next day. But this past weekend, I had a gentleman and he was 51 and maybe you guys think, oh, he had, he's old or he had existing conditions or whatever you want. But he was maxed out. He had the most oxygen you can have without being intubated. He'd been there for two weeks. He had all the treatments you could have. He was lovely. He was nice. He was friendly. They wouldn't send him to ICU because there weren't any ICU beds left. So we were watching him. And the ICU doctor came over to see him on the regular floor and told him to think and pray about whether or not he wanted to live on a ventilator so that his family didn't have to decide later. And when I left. Thank, thank you, Ms. Buck. I'm sorry. Thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. He told me he knew God was going to do great things the next day. And he was excited. And the next day he was. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Uh, Catherine McCown. Uh, Ms. McCown lives in Lexington and has students that attend Midway, Medical and Middle, and River Bluff. I uh, never thought I'd put this shirt on again, but hey, here we are. Um, first, I wanted to, you know, y'all kind of did throw us for a loop with all the surveys, and, and then nobody even responded to data, so sorry. Um, just want to ease everybody's mind out there watching that um, these guys have no power. <laughs> They're not going to be able to change anything. Um, and, uh, you know, when it comes back around um, for the provisio to be taken out of the budget and for it to become a law, then, you know, that's when it will be done. Um, but don't worry about your kids having to go to school in a mask. These guys aren't going to be able to do that. If they do, um, it'll be because they think they're above the law and they um, take matters into their own hands like Charleston's doing. Have you seen all that madness? I mean, it is crazy. These kids are living in like crazy times. Um, next, I would like the board to hear just a little bit about my kids, which you've heard dozens and dozens of testimonies today about um, everybody's kids being quarantined and these crazy um, guidelines that y'all are going off of with DHEC. Um, the madness really has to stop with this quarantine stuff. Um, our kids are being denied education. Um, they really deserve to have, you know, time in school. And, and two of my children were sent home for 14 days and they never got sick. So when you put up the 7.1% of kids sent home quarantined that became positive, I, I never got a question, a call, an email from anybody asking me if my kid was ever positive. So how can you say that? How, how, where does that 7.1% ever come in to play? That's not a, that's not a correct number. Because I have two children that I never, no one ever contacted me about. So um, would love to know that answer. Probably will never get it. Um, but, you know, we all know that the kids need to be in school. Um, and uh, I guess I would just say that the main reason why I showed up tonight was because I feel very strongly that the kids are being discriminated against. Um, you know, the fact that you can send my kids home with no proof, none of the schools, even though my husband and I stood in the school and spoke to 
the nurse, the teacher, the school administrator, the principal, nobody would provide us proof that our child was actually exposed. And we're just supposed to believe y'all. We're just supposed to believe that they were exposed and just send them home with no education. My daughter was sent home with an email if you have questions. So she went to school and was, you know, failing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Ms. McCow. Next, we have Debbie Heim. Ms. Heim lives in Lexington and has a student that attends Lexington High School. I love when you send out surveys. Look at all this participation. Y'all should keep this up. People come, they listen, they watch. This will be another video that gets thousands of views, I bet. Um, I appreciate the teachers, the staff, the coaches, the orchestra teacher that my kids use every day, but there is a real problem uh, in this district with honesty and transparency uh, with a number of you here in this room. I have concerns about the social emotional resiliency survey, specifically the lack of transparency that our district has. At registration, there were several surveys the district was offering. One of these was a grade three through 12 uh, that parents recently received a consent form for. At registration, it said, you have the right to review upon request any materials. And then it provided sample questions. When I asked the district and my principal about reviewing the materials, I was told I could only see the sample, that the assessment was proprietary and copyrighted. Let me make sure I understand this. I must give my consent to you to ask questions of my minor children, where a report will be prepared about them individually, identifiable by their student ID number, and available to administrators and school counselors. The district wants to, quote, learn which students might benefit from additional services so they can design, implement, and evaluate interventions to help my kid. You claim this is not diagnostic, but there can be interventions, maybe some at home, maybe some at school. This will not be administered by a licensed therapist, psychologist, or any other mental health professional because the student will take this on their school-issued device in the presence of a teacher, like their math or English teacher. Now, and this is a very important part, the school says I cannot access this survey from this private company, but when I called Dr. Rich Gilman, CEO at the company, Terrace Metrics, he says I can certainly look at it, yeah. He said any parent who wants to see the assessment can get in touch with the point of contact person for the district and schedule a time to go to the school to see the assessment. They don't want me to take a copy home, but the assessment is available to parents to see exactly as a student would see it on their laptop all the way through to the end entirely. The school lied. This wasn't a mistake because they said they checked with Terrace Metrics and they said they're, quote, unable to share with me. Even the company's own website under their FAQ page asked, do districts and schools have access to the survey questions? Answer, yes. I'm a big believer in good mental health, but because the district can choose some of the questions on this, here are some of the sample questions. Uh, on a sliding scale, strongly agree or disagree. Spiritual beliefs are a source of strength for me. I participate in organized religious activities. I enjoy my cultural and family traditions. I am proud to be a citizen of the United States, and I am proud of my ethnic background. What business is this of the districts? What interventions might be planned if a kid has conflicting feelings on any of this? There are additional screeners for grades six through 12, including drugs and alcohol and trauma screeners, including sexual assault, but the school won't let me see these questions. So I can decide if my child wants to participate. It's funny how tonight a parent must give consent for a mental health screener, including screeners for if a student is physically causing harm to others, but the board wants to be able to mandate a physical health apparatus that is entirely unregulated and blocks the vital areas of children whom, for all we know, could already have natural immunity. I'll see you next time. Thank you, Ms. Heim. Next, we have Matthew Heim. Mr. Heim lives in Lexington and has a student that attends Lexington High School. Oh, good evening. Hey, Dr. Guyton, you are a fantastic storyteller. Lay them on us. They're good to hear. Um, remember the scene in Braveheart, right? Sir William Wallace is fighting and he's being publicly executed at the end and the Kingsman's trying to get a confession or some sort of admission that he was wrong so he can beg for a quick death. And then what happens? He uses his last breaths to yell, freedom, 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 freedom. If you watch the crowd at the execution, they act as if they'd never even heard that word before. And honestly, I'd, I'd written this afternoon and then I heard it this morning and I thought it's really ironic that here we are, all last year the board had all kinds of power to implement masks. There were absolutely no restrictions, but they were happy to let the South Carolina Department of Education policy stand. Now that power has been taken away from them and they want it back. So that freedom disappears, now they want it back. 
That's exactly how parents feel about the freedom to let their kids wear a mask or not. I don't understand what's so complicated about this. Clearly, everyone in this room understands what that is. It's just really confusing me. Um, so kind of moving on then. I also have no doubt that uh, four board members in this, vote, in this room will vote in favor of item 10.3 on the board resolution, because uh, it wouldn't be an agenda item unless the vote was already known. That's just how this board operates in case there's anybody who hasn't been paying attention or watching. Um, another really important thing to note is that's probably just advisory, I'm guessing. I don't think there is any binding power in that. So that means the state legislatures will take a look at it and they'll probably vote or not vote on it. Just depends. Depends how many they get. Could be interesting though if enough boards show up there asking for the power back. I don't really know how that would end up. Another interesting thing though is the school board is a political office. When the public does not like the job a politician is doing, they show up. In fact, I heard one board member say that he'd even ask the governor for his power back to you know, implement masks and other mitigation tools. Um, you're responsible for your office. You took an oath. You know, one board, board member told us to move if we're unhappy. But that's not how American politics work. You know, I would suggest if you do not like the public's opinion of your performance, then you can resign. It's a voluntary position. Please separate the political office from the person. We are not here to attack you as a person, but we are here to attack your office and the job that you're doing because it affects our kids, our kids. It's really just that simple. There are a few sacred cows and that is absolutely one of them for every parent. So please be careful with that power. It's kind of like a, hey, your decision's impacting my life and my kids. Can you please, you know, clean that up a little bit? That's really the position we're trying to take. We're not trying to be mean or rude. Um, you're also responsible for the districts, how they treat employees. Uh, I've only got 13 seconds, but there's a real issue with how the public's treated by the employees of this district. Um, everything's a FOIA. You want a job description, FOIA. You want a contract for a building, FOIA. You know, FOIA is to protect us from secret government activity. And my time's up, but just keep that Thank in mind. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Uh, next, we have Michael McCown. Uh, he lives in Lexington, has students that attend Midway, Meadow Glen Middle, and River Bluff High School. All right, guys, I'll, I'll probably won't take all three minutes. It's getting past my bedtime and probably half the people in here. So I'll try to be as brief as possible about this. But I did want to thank the teachers specifically, um, if you're listening. Uh, Miss Mixon, she's in fifth grade. Um, she's my son's teacher. If you've ever sat through a Zoom with kids in elementary school, it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare. Sometimes they don't show up. And because the technology's not there or whatever, but kids are yelling, they're talking, they're not, they can't, hey, will you please mute your, your Zoom? Whatever, we hear this all the time. It's, it's hilarious. Um, also, Mr. Ard, he's an art teacher at Midway. Um, <laughs> teaching art through Zoom is, it's, terrible. He's like, click on this link. And then half the students could, the other half are blocked. My son had to get me to come turn it on the TV so he could watch somebody do, do a painting. And he ended up with like a really pretty cat. But thank you to Mr. Ard. And I also want to thank the home teachers too. Like my wife, she she does, she has two jobs and, and myself, I work from home, thankfully. Um, so I can, I was, I'm able to help my kids. Um, so thanks to the home teachers, seriously. I'm not being I'm not being completely serious. Um, thank you to your teachers. You guys are killing it with very little support, in my opinion. A few things I won't note in the minutes tonight for you guys. Um, the mass survey I sent in to you guys was extremely subjective. It was per household and not per kid. Um, last year it was per kid. Uh, I feel like I have three kids in the district. I have three votes. Um, so I want that noted. And secondly, I want noted that any other survey that was mentioned tonight there was a fox news survey mentioned tonight um i want that stricken from the from the record unless it could be presented and approved by the board um and lastly but not least i'll finish up within a minute but just want to tell you a little story about my my quarantine i'm a, a country boy as well from lexington and grew up here and that's why i'm here and that's why i'm fighting for these kids but so i'm on my zoom call I'm having uh, meetings with my clients and I have my healthy quarantine son at home downstairs and I have my healthy quarantine daughter upstairs. Um, she comes to ask me a question after I get off my call. Um, she's like, Dad, I'm in the middle of this test. I don't understand uh, what, it, what it is, what it's about. I looked at it, helped help walk her through it. And I said, hey, why don't you reach out to your teacher? She said, 
okay, well, I guess I got to email her. Okay. So he, she, he, uh, she emailed her. She didn't get a response back immediately. I ended up emailing a teacher, talking to her. She, she sent us about a 24-hour turnaround time on a question from a student. That's kind of unacceptable. I said, okay, well, what about a Zoom? Can you schedule a Zoom with them? She said, yeah. Well, how long does that request take? Mm, it takes 24 hours. Guys, come on. It's not acceptable. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Not, um, last, we have Ms. Lee Sue Kim. And Ms. Kim lives in Lexington and has a student at River Bluff High School. Thank you. Good evening. And I will never forget the day when I pick up my son, who is a high school student, ninth grader last year. And the first semester, he didn't get an opportunity to go to school because of the pandemic. So the second semester, two days, he was so happy. I will never forget when I pick him up from school, he came to my car, into the car, sit down, say, well, mama, it is so good to be back to school. But it is so sad. We had to sit so far apart that I couldn't talk to my friends. But anyway, it's better than staying at home. And this year, we are so excited. The school was reopened for full time, five days. And then we got, he got home. And we can see that anxiety because he was so afraid of being quarantined. So today, I'm addressing to the board and about stop quarantine healthy children, please. And I'm going to cite some resources and to share the information to let you know that quarantine healthy children is really baseless. And I'm gonna share the information from the CDC website about vaccine breakthrough infection. According to CDC, vaccine breakthrough infection defined as the detection of SARS-CoV-2 RNA or antigen in a respiratory specimen collected from a person greater than 14 days after they have completed or recommended doses of a U.S. Food and Drug Administration authorized COVID-19 vaccine. According to the same source, as of August 23rd, 2021, and this is um, three weeks ago because I prepared this one for the last board meeting, but the citizen participation was not allowed. So that's the data from them. 2,063 fully vaccinated people died of COVID-19 infection. 8,987 fully vaccinated people have been hospitalized. According to CDC director, and Wineski doing a CNN interview. She said fully vaccinated people who get a COVID-19 breakthrough infection can spread the virus to others, even if they are not symptomatic. Our vaccines are working exceptional well, she said. They continue to work well with Delta with regard to severe illness and death. But what they can do anymore is prevent transmission. So I urge you to stop quarantine healthy children because stop quarantine healthy children is baseless according to CDC's data and the director's code. Thank you very Thank much. You, Ms. All right, I believe that concludes our citizens participation. Uh, we will move into item 10.0 after a very quick break. About three minutes. <laughs> 